Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 10th episode of The Happiest Hour on Earth. 10 episodes, I can't even wow, believe it. we're here already. It's such a special episode, and since it is such a milestone in our podcast, we decided to make it extra special by bringing on an extra special guest tonight, Sandra Gukunek, who is a former Imagineer. She is going to be on and telling some amazing stories about her time as an Imagineer um, in the 80s and 90s, and uh, she has some amazing stories, and we cannot wait for you guys to hear them. And since it is such a special episode, we decided to make the most quintessential Disney snacks ever. Emily, can you tell us about these? Yes, I can. So this is a Dole Whip. Um, yeah, I think definitely a favorite among Disneyland guests. Uh, it, it had more of a swirl look to it earlier. It's definitely a little more melty at this point. Um, oh, yeah. It's hard to achieve that soft serve uh, look. Yeah. As we realized, um, we, we got it there earlier, but it did get a little bit melty. If you look on our reel on Instagram, we actually got it pretty soft servey, but then in the five minutes that we took to get set everything up and here. get this started, it melted. Got, um, got melty. But that also is due to the fact that we made a little bit of a boozy Dole Whip. Yes. Yeah, so... If you could see in our reel, we started with the regular Dole Whip, which you can find here. Just your standard Dole Whip, right? Now, a lot of also people love delicious. the Dole Whip float, right? Two ounces of pineapple juice, right? If you want to do it. Now I'm really nervous. It's going to overflow <laughs> I'm after sure pouring you're that. Be but flowing. <laughs> let's say you want to add a little more spice to the Dole Whip float after you stir it. I'm so nervous. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, Maybe let me try, let me try the Dole Whip float to make sure it doesn't overflow. <laughs> there you go. I think you're incredible, safe incredible. So Delicious. that is your Dole Whip float. Now let's say you want to add a little bit more of a pirate vibe to it. You want to add a little rum, right? Here we go. The Please rum's not overflow. always gone. <laughs> the rum is not always gone at the happiest hour on earth. Oh, okay. Oh, you made it. I made it. Another two ounces of your favorite type of rum. Pour that in, stir it up. And now you have a Little... boozy Dole Whip float. Incredible. Yeah. Well, I haven't tried it yet. Let's give I'm it sure a try. Let's see. Oh, let's cheers. Oh, awesome. Has just enough kick mm -hmm. to make it that piratey vibe, but also that <laughs> islandy vibe. It's incredible. And also, if you are not following Darling of Disney on Instagram, she has made these cups. You can't really see it in the video. You could probably see it in our reel, but she makes these in amazing engraved um, Disney glasses, different types of Disney glasses. And we have been loving these so much, but also her Instagram is just perfect. So much Disney amazingness, so follow Darling of Disney, uh, find her website and grab some some amazing some really Disney cool glasses. Really cool glasses, yeah. They're mine, so awesome. Mine is Fantasmic inspired, and I love it. Oh, it's so great! It's so mm -hmm. they're they're amazing. So um, definitely do that. And so there's our Dole Whips, our boozy Dole Whips. We also brought back the other favorite that we've had on here before. Yeah. But it came in such a big pack that we have had a ton of them left over in our freezer. So we decided, what the heck, we're going to bring Maturo back with the Dole Whips. And they're in Roman numeral X10 for a 10th episode. So <laughs> Unplanned. Unplanned. But the, hey, that works. Obviously, we know how amazing these are. If you did not catch our other episode, you could grab the actual churros, churros that Disney makes at... Um, Smart and Final. Smart and Final. They are... Oh, Tio no. Pepe churros. That is what they use. Buy them, make them at home, and literally have a slice of Disney in your house. It's so awesome. delicious. So perfect. Spot on. So, quick Disney news. We got a trailer for Marvel's Eternals, which looks so amazing. Directed by Chloe Zhao, um, who made Nomadland. Uh, an amazing film, and now she is helming this marvel movie that looks different from everything else which i think is very very exciting we got the trailer for that and it looks beautiful amazing mm -hmm. and so exciting um we also 
technically today when we're filming this. We've had our first cast member preview into Avengers Campus. And a lot of people, um, when you go into Avengers Campus for the cast member previews, they have been confiscating your phone. So we haven't seen video of the Spider-Man attraction, but it, it is set to open um, a week and a half from now. I think next Friday. So that's super exciting. We'll be able to see inside Avengers Campus. Um, going to be so awesome. A new part of Disneyland that we have not yet seen, but that's pretty much the stuff that comes to mind. But um, I'm ready to get Sandra onto the show. Uh, yeah. So let's go ahead and call her up. Hey, Sandra, welcome to the happiest hour on earth. Thank you so much for joining our Thank show. Thank you for coming on. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. When we heard that one of our friends had an aunt who was an Imagineer, we were both so, so excited. So excited. You're the first Imagineer we've ever talked to. And I <laughs> oh, really? we're so excited. So that's why we're like, we have to wait till episode 10. That's a big milestone of our show. Gotta celebrate we'll big. <laughs> oh, and the 10th anniversary. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so exciting. So um, for our, I know we've talked a little bit. Um, We've kind of heard a little bit about what you did at the parks, but for our listeners, um, can you just kind of tell them a little bit about yourself when you started as an Imagineer and what led you to Disney? So my name is Sandra Gutnick and I was first an Imagineer in um, 1988. <laughs> and what took me there is I got an engineering degree. I'm an industrial engineer. And I got that degree from um, California Polytechnic University in Pomona. And there was a woman who was graduating the year that I started, and she got this job at Disneyland. Oh, wow. My gosh. Um, they had an industrial engineering department. They were part of the maintenance division. And um, she had talked them into a co-op program for six months. And I applied, and I got hired. So during my fifth year at school, I think, um, I did this six month, uh, gig at Disneyland. Um, we had an office in a, um, in a four wide trailer building behind, I think this isn't there in the park anymore, but behind bear country. Wow. Behind bear country cool. yeah. And so I was there for six months. Wow. Yeah. I was there for six months and, um, and then I went back and then I finished school and there was not a position at Disneyland, so I got a job um, at a hospital in um, in Burbank, St. Joseph Medical Center. Actually, St. Joseph Medical Center is the hospital that Walt Disney died in. Um, and so, um, and that got a little crazy. And after a year, um, I got hired back at Disneyland, wow. and I was there for about three years. And uh, Disney went through a lot of changes, and so I left. Um, for a while. And then the company that I was working for moved about 70 miles away and I didn't, I didn't want to go in the move. So I reached out oh. to friends at Disneyland um, at the time and they put me in touch with WDI. Oh. And we all remember WDI at Disneyland because they were mm. all the crazy, you know, architects and designers and stuff that came yeah. down and wanted to do crazy things in the park that we found to be inefficient and <laughs> they, you know, and they had funny hairdos and stuff like that. And, um, but anyhow, they were, they were hiring. And so I got hired on at WDI in the maintenance or facilities division. And the first year I was there, WDI grew from 400 employees to 800 employees so oh they doubled gosh. in Double. size in a year wow. oh and gosh. you know most companies kind of don't survive that and yeah. then the second year they grew from 800 employees to 1200 employees oh my no gosh way. so another 50 percent growth again the second year so wow. we were going crazy trying to find places to put these people where yeah. they could work and um, so that was kind of what my job was. And so I was designing space for special effects, for research and development. They had a mini uh, roller coaster in the parking lot of their building um, <laughs> where the mechanical engineers designed rides and the electrical engineers. And then uh, the last project was designing the manufacturing space in North Hollywood 
where we built all the audio audio animatronic figures and then developed the show sets um because it was a great big warehouse building 100,000 square foot warehouse building in Tahunga um and I designed how that space got built out and allocated so that was kind of my role and then I got from there I got hired by the director of the manufacturing group to run their estimating team because um okay well I'll just I'll just, this is a thread. So we'll just tell the thread. Um, You know, WDI doesn't sell anything. They're not a company that produces a product that they sell and and that's how they make money. They're a project based company. So they have to be funded by the studio, Mm -hmm. which we would confectionally call mom and dad. Mom and dad needed to write us a check so that we could (laughs) conduct our business. So the projects were all a pitch. And they would go through stages. And I think that was one of your questions about the development of projects. And I can wait and talk about that. But um, anyhow, everything is estimated then. And then you put that together in a project budget. And so we had a team of gentlemen who knew how to estimate the things that the company actually manufactured for the attractions. And so we would be involved in the very early concept stages all the way down to like final production budgets. And so it was about, what were we like, eight eight guys or something like that, that that worked for me. Wow. So then that was kind of my last role at at WDI. So when you, so was that estimating kind of the cost of a project? Yeah. And then was that, did you guys in that also have to kind of estimate if that would increase ticket price or, uh, you know, attendance as well. And did you have to take that into consideration? Was there kind of like a, this is the cost, but the benefit will be this as well. Or is it mainly? So when I was at, when I was at Disneyland, a very instant, interesting statistic is that, um, oh gosh, have I lost these statistics? I want to say it's more than 50% of the attendance at Disneyland comes from within a 150 mile radius. Oh, really? So it's repeat. Oh. So what they found yeah. over the years, and we would study this, and they use the same statistics at WDI, is that if you did not create what, and it, they still call them e-attractions. This is long yeah. gone before your guys. <laughs> but, you know, in the early days of Disneyland, you got a ticket book, right? You had e-tickets. Yeah, yeah. Right? They still call them e-attractions. That's literally what they still call them. Yeah. Um, and if you did not install an e-attraction, um, I want to say the e-attractions were like every four years and there had oh. to be like at least a sea level attraction mm. every That's other year. You could yeah. visibly watch the attendance drop off and then you could see where they installed X attraction, you know, like um, Star Tours, the roller coaster, oh, yeah, right? Yeah. And then- and then, psh, and then Big Thunder Mountain attendance would go back up, and then oh my you gosh. know Indiana Jones attendance would go back up. Wow. So Easy. again, you know, you don't um, install those rides and and sell things, right? But they realize yeah. that if you don't install them, you wow. lose the gate. Yeah, and that's that's interesting that they knew kind of a specific time period, like they could. They could do some smaller rides within that four years, but every four years or so, like you said, you needed to have one completed in order to kind of fix that dip that they were experiencing the park because everyone yeah. would come back and want to experience that. Wow, mm-hmm. that is so crazy. Interesting, and I feel yeah. like you so still that was see sort that of the parks today. Like at, after time goes on, yeah. there's a long time where there isn't a huge, huge new attraction. Mm-hmm. And then every so often they, they have yeah. to, you know, and then the talk and, just... and, and socialize <laughs> about this, this new ride. So, wow, that yeah. is so interesting. I wonder if it's yeah. the same model that four years still today. That's cool. Yeah, so it probably is because I think the statistic is about the same. But that's why you see then they when I was there, they had started to plan the California Adventure. Oh it really? Oh, wow. Some different things over the years, but mm-hmm. yeah. And they kept trying to do it in the parking lot and Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, so I saw a lot of scale models of what they wanted to do, but then oh, it wow. would get shelved and then they were doing Europe and and yeah. then they get on financially hard times after Europe. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, but it finally, you know, it did finally come to pass, but I I remember seeing the little kind of quarter scale models of all, all that laid out cuz they had that oh, idea for a long time. They knew they needed to do something big. Yeah. 
That is yeah, so definitely. Cool. Especially since they didn't have a lot of space in California. I mean, but on the Disney streaming service, Disney Plus, they have a show about Imagineers, and they'll they'll talk a little bit about this. But um, but when they were talking about Disneyland being built, all the hotels and everything came around it, so they didn't really have a lot of space to work with. They where Disney expand. World, Disney bought a whole bunch of land, but Disneyland, they were like, we just have this parking lot, and we need to you know, build something there. That's the only space you really have. But wow, that's so interesting hearing that it was talked about for a while, but kept getting shelved and other projects, you know, took over yeah. California Adventure for a while. Wow. They said that to us a lot. You know, that was Walt's comment is that the mm. one thing they don't have in Florida is the limitation of land. That's, mm. he yeah. just, you know, he bought a lot of land to do a lot Tons of things. So and that much. was the problem in, in California was it just, didn't buy a lot of land. I worked with yeah. a guy in the maintenance division um, who actually had um, worked on building the park. He had been a bricklayer on uh, Sleeping Beauty's castle. Right? Oh, wow. And uh, so he had been there all, all those years. And he talked about it. He said they were laying bricks. And the guys are like, you know, well, this job is supposed to wrap up, you know, in June of 1955. And then where you're going to get work? Because every prediction was that this would be a monumental flop. I mean, no one would wow. come. No one would like it. Right. You probably read that or heard that. that and, is, uh, yeah, that's and he crazy. he's like, yeah, all of us, you know, we're laying bricks talking about where we're going to get the next job because there's not going to be any work here. Right. Because this thing is going to die. That's so wow. crazy. <laughs> Look at it now. So funny. <laughs> no one expected that it would be to this day their continual building. It just that keeps is growing. So mm-hmm. Do you do you want to get the next question? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we'll move on to the next one. So we were just wondering what rides you worked on when you were working in Disneyland, and if you had a favorite. Um, when I was at Imagineering, mm-hmm. so like I said, I was part of the. Well, so the first few years, I was a part of the maintenance division. So we were ramping up because they were expanding in Florida. We were building Mm -hmm. the park in Japan, and then they were going to build another park in Japan. You know, they built... um, Mm -hmm. um, Disney Sea. um, Yeah, Disney Sea. I was going to say a water theme park. And um, Mm -hmm. eventually ramping up to build in France. So in that sense, I touched, you know... I touched all these rides. Um, you know, the early oh, wow. we wow. had a studio where they make the scale models of the rides. So you have people that are, oh. you know, sculptures, and they're sculpting in clay, sculpting in yeah. foam, um, all the way, you know, through the rides and dealing with the group. So I, in that sense, I just like touched everything the company was doing, which was pretty cool. When I got into estimating then, oh, wow. um, we were estimating and building Indiana Jones um, at the California, at Disneyland, right? The tower, I remember, yeah. <laughs> I have some you know, mem- distinct memories of Tower of Terror in Florida. That was in the movie oh, studio. Oh, I Florida, love that ride. When that went in. Um, and then um, some of the stuff for Disney Seas. And then a lot of what I was touching in the estimating world um, was the early stages of the p- park in, in France. Oh, wow. Okay. Oh, wow. So I think, um, yeah, so Indiana Jones. Oh, and Star Star Tours. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, wow. That's yeah, that so one was, cool. a, I, I don't think they had done a ride like that, you know, Ever. And so that was mm-hmm. a that was a big, big hit. And Indiana Jones is my favorite ride. Yeah. I used to have an Indiana yeah. Jones shirt and I think it's at my parents' house some somewhere. Yeah. Um, I was like, you have to wear your Indiana Jones shirt. I couldn't find it today, but I wanted to wear it because I heard that you worked <laughs> a little bit on it. And um but yeah, and then when you were doing the estimating for Tower of Terry, did you think that was a pretty crazy ride concept that it was gonna be an elevator just falling and dropping all over the place? Was that pretty interesting to hear? <laughs> Yeah, it was. They went through quite a few elevator vendors. They were actually going to make it be an elevator. And Mm -hmm. so, like, they reached out to Otis Elevator. Mm -hmm. And Otis said, they listened to the concepts. (laughs) They they told me the guys came back and they said, you don't understand in the elevator business what you're talking about 
is the sensation that the elevator car is cut loose and like does this free fall drop. Oh We're gosh. in the business of making sure that, <laughs> that never happen. happens. Oh my gosh, that's so true. We don't have any skill sets to do what you want to do. <laughs> the, the only skill set is to not do that. Do that. <laughs> yeah. We don't that's do so that. Funny. Oh my gosh, especially if they had their name on it, Otis Elevators. Yeah. yeah. You know, some like, people oh, might I don't say, they don't those. want that. So we actually so scrubbed it and they built that ride from scratch. Our engineers, wow. I think probably wow. with some outside consultants, but they built that. So it's actually a type of like a roller coaster ride and it's not free fall. Yeah. It feels yeah. like free fall, but you're always connected. And then yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> There's always oh, something well, to stop. Yeah, it. that is one Good. of our it's my, one of our favorites. It's I love that one. And, it's and we so don't, good. I don't know. When I first heard about it, I think the first time I went on it was the California version, which came out after yeah. Florida. And I think I was still pretty young. And I think my parents bribed me to go <laughs> on it with like a toy or something. Like, if you go on this, we'll buy you a Mickey stuffed animal or something. <laughs> and so I went on it and they got me on it. And I think I acted scared so I would still get the stuffed animal. But... I he loved it. internally loved it so much. Was so it was and I went on it as like a teenager for the first time, but I, I was terrified. And then I was like, I just want to keep going back on it over yeah, and over. It's, it's fun so one. fun. You know what I should have looked for? I didn't think about it because I think it's here in my desk. But I have a picture of me sitting in one of the Tower of Terror ride vehicles in the building in Tahunga. Oh my oh, gosh, it's so cool. I don't know if the ride has changed, but at least in the early days, this thing like on remote control drove around through the building, right? And Rod oh. Sterling is saying mm-hmm. things to you and stuff yeah. is coming and going in images. And then you and then you get in the elevator and then you fall. That and so they mocked crazy. that up in our building. And so they asked a bunch of us to come down and get in the vehicle so it had the right weight and that oh, we could experience wow. it. And then they then they drove us through a mock-up of what their ride would be. That so, yeah, is so yeah. cool. Yeah. That, um, so we have another question here. Um, so when a, when a new project is announced internally, what is the development process like? Um, I'm sure that they, you know, the company announces it before the public even knows about it. Um, and then from there, does it get handed to a specific department? And then do you, does everyone know or does it go to a department and can't kind of keep it secret for a little bit and then it goes to another department? What's that process like? Um, so if you've noticed, <laughs> um, with very little exception, Disney's rides are based on movies. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. Right. Fantasyland is the little dark rides. Those are all the animated movies that Disney made. Mm-hmm. And then... Um, now, Space Mountain is just a space roller coaster, but Star Tours is, yeah. you know, the movie Indiana Jones is a movie. Yeah. So a lot of the motivation or ideas for the ride springs off of movies they did that were popular. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, they took that submarine ride in Disneyland, which has become kind of a sleeper, and they turned it into Finding <laughs> Nemo. And so Nemo is yeah, the yeah. ride. So. <laughs> a lot of the inspiration for the rides comes from the movies, but there are always ideas mm. for rides. So the way mm. WDI is organized is there's this kind of creative layer at the top. And actually the top management of WDI, at least when I was there, I have no idea what it is now, but I, I think this model worked. <laughs> is it's a dual leadership. You have a creative lead. When I was there was a guy named... Um, mm. Oops, let me not try to remember the name now because it's going to escape out of my head. Um, you, had, you had a creative lead and you had a business lead because a truly creative person, which is what the company's in the business of, is not going to be the guy to run your accounting and your negotiations and your contracts and all this kind of stuff, right? So they did that for a while. Their, their rides went hugely over budget and behind schedule and because the creative process never stops. And then they, it was kind of in my tenure, it's like, we need a business person to rein this in. So there's always a tension in that creative process, like, oh, the, they always talk about the bean counters. And it was never said in a pleasant tone of voice, right? Bean counters, <laughs> right? That were like the enemy. So you have this creative layer at the top and 
you know, a lot of these, some of these guys knew Walt, at least when I was, I mean, this is so long ago now that is gone, but mm. these guys like were the keepers of the sacred trust of ideas. And so mm. there would be this internal review with this team and some floating of it to corporate, to the studio, but something would would gel. And I don't really know what that process was, but why did we pick this Indiana Jones ride? I don't really know. Mm. But it would go through some iterations. It's, you know, and also, is this an E attraction? Is it a C attraction? Yeah. And um, E attractions at that time, I think, were $200 million. And of course, the question was, mm. you know, the company, it takes about $200 million to um, produce something like Little Mermaid. And you look mm -hmm. at all the money Disney makes on Little Mermaid. There's the movie, there's the videos, there's the yeah. little dresses, the costume, the purses, the, the stuffed animals, the toys, right? It's just <laughs> yeah. endless. Yeah. So should we spend $200 million making Little Mermaid or $200 million making a ride that in a couple of years won't be drawing the people at the gate and we just have to make wow. Yeah. So these are wow. all these all questions this... a company had to ask, right? Where's yeah. the investment go? Yeah. Um, so that would go to corporate and you would get this initial concept monies they get an initial phase of concept monies mm. so then you would come down and now you would get kind of a different level of architects and engineering because it's really wdi is an architectural engineering design firm yeah mm -hmm. and um so they would be able to throw some numbers out based on other you know e attractions we want to have 12 audio animatronic figures that are humans mm. or are animals, but they will be a lot like pirates and pirates cost us X. And, you know, <laughs> they would put these budgets together. But at some point as this thing still gains legs, gets exposure to other more creative folks and to the studio and people are gaining an enthusiasm. That's a great idea. What about this? What about that? Yeah. They also will start to build models. And so this is where some of my team would get involved. They start to build scale models and they'd stand them up on platforms so that you could walk through them. Your eye level would be about the eye level of the ride vehicle that you would be in. Oh, right. Wow. So you could get this idea. And yeah. this is where, you know, the ride is 10 minutes. So the ride becomes 12 minutes back to eight minutes, you know, because how many sets and i don't know you realize like haunted mansion is a perfect one right they turn that ride vehicle to you to see what yeah. they want you to see mm -hmm. right what's yeah, yeah. behind you is is black right so you think yeah. the money goes in that you want you to see, we want you to see this and we want you to see this and none yeah. of the rest of this stuff has got any <laughs> treatment to it at all so yeah, that important. all comes out in these scale models Wow. And oh eventually then there's enough of a pitch to corporate. You're moving through. And I'm trying to think there's, I've seen other things move through the stages. It's a little bit like a product design. I mean, you have a basic concept, you know, you have like concept design and then yeah. you have like kind of a more of a proof design. And then, you know, as there continues to be favorable view to this and a price and an interest, then in each one of these stages, there has to be another estimate that goes back to mom and dad, <laughs> and check, right back to corporate, wow. to the studio. Yeah. So that facility in Burbank is both the movie studio, but it's also the company's corporate headquarters. I mean, all the hotels, the theme parks, everything, right? So it's corporate. We would call it the studio, but it's this kind of different function um, yeah. until you get now we're ready to start like a production build. And I remember wow. sitting in meetings with the estimators, like they had come up with these dollars, do you know, to make the odd, cause we were now talking about the audio animatronic figures, the electronics cabinets that design all this stuff, anyhow, ride vehicles. And so then, you know, you had a little doc who quacked its bill and wiggled its table and moved its head and well we can't afford to have it move its head oh, we got to take that no. out of that oh, <laughs> you could start you know so crazy wow. <laughs> scaling down all your little <laughs> animals so oh. until you know then you got approval for your production build and then we would launch into production and then um installation and programming and then of course there's the build on site you know, so the buildings constructed on site oh, and then yeah. we were making things that were shipping down there. Yeah. That was kind of the stages that, wow. that went through, but 
definitely like a level, a conceptual estimate, and then you would get increasingly detailed, you know, estimates until that project team would go back, and now you had a budget to build. So wow, wow. and then so process. was that? Did it go kind of both ways? Like, would head management maybe have an idea, and they would say, "Oh, like, can we try to build a ride like this?" Or was it mainly some Imagineers, like the head Imagineers? coming up with an idea and then pitching it and then getting approval. Was that kind of how it worked most of the time? Yeah, like, hey, can we do this? And then, yeah, they looked oh, okay. to these creative guys at Imagine. That was their job to come up with the rides and attraction oh, wow. ideas. So cool hearing all this. I, I'm in business. So hearing like all that, sh- the structures of um, how things work is really exciting to me, yeah. um, especially in like such yeah, a you know, and you know, company. One of your questions too was about are things, uh, and maybe I'm jumping ahead, but are things really secretive? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it's not a government military installation, right? Um, <laughs> it, it was an interesting aura, and this is a little history of the company as well, because they said you would talk to people at Disneyland And no, I Hmm. talked to people down there and told them I work for Walt Disney Imagineering. And literally people are like, what is that? (laughs) Oh, really? Oh my gosh. So many people have never heard of it. I think it's maybe a little more known now, but they liked that idea that we were this clandestine organization because you would talk to people about, well, where do you think Disneyland comes from? And I mean, we, we saw these interviews, they would tell us these stories, right? And it was like, well, it's just here, isn't it? Because it's magical, right? Yeah. Like, it's magical. So it's like, yeah. like, well, I don't know. Like, what do you mean? Where did it come from? It's just like here. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah. You, you guys are so, almost oh. working behind the scenes to make it magical for people. They don't even have to think about you guys. You guys are just... Working and yeah, making and they it come didn't, true. Right? Yeah. They didn't want people to think about us. They didn't want people to know who yeah. we are. Um, I mean, some of it is trade secrets, right? Because Universal was like, you know, across the freeway, Universal Studios. Mm-hmm. But yeah. also the sense that Universal, there was a sense of personal pride that Universal Studios, no matter how hard they try, would never be what we were. <laughs> there's, and there's reasons for that, I think. There's reasons for that. Yeah, but yeah. um it was more just kind of this aura that we're part of the magic by being the man behind the curtain, so to speak. That is and so, so cool. And so they, oh. when they went from 400 to 800, 800 to 1200, um, I'm sorry, that's not right. I have to the numbers. They went from 800 to 1600 and from 1600 to 2400 i'm sorry oh my that's gosh. the numbers oh, they hired wow. 800 and then hired 800 again that was oh the first three years that i was there my so yeah, they were there was leasing they were in a couple of big buildings yeah. right yeah. we were putting disney on every street corner i think at the time yeah. <laughs> but their main building is 1401 flower street and um we started leasing other buildings in this light commercial industrial park right as wow. they would become available we would lease the next one and if you notice the name tags it's that oval mm-hmm. and at wdi mm-hmm. we have a little bump at the top and mickey is in there with your name so all of the building address plaques were in the shape of our name tags and they put them up on the buildings and that is the only thing that would ever indicate that building had anything to do wow. with this. Wow. Oh the park is completely wow. unmarked. That's crazy. So what's going on inside the buildings could be totally crazy, but the whole outside of the Just, building and the parks no. Oh indication. my gosh, that is so cool. <laughs> because you don't want people yeah. To, yeah. to know. It's just this aura. It's yeah. more the aura of of yeah, yeah. you know <laughs> Don't then like trade secrets are competitive yeah, advanced. Reminds wow. me of uh, the Wizard of Oz almost. Yeah. The man behind the curtain. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Kind of yes, the man the curtain. <laughs> okay, yeah. so um our next question. Um so a lot of people today would love to be an imagineer and are trying to become imagineers and there's a lot of competition. Um so, you know, a lot of people I think might be hesitant to even try just due to the competition. But how was it 
uh, in the eighties, do you think it's gotten more competitive since then? I, like I said, for myself, it didn't feel competitive. They were, well, I can talk to you about the hiring boom because I have a couple of stories, <laughs> but I had been at Disneyland, right? So I had mm. connections to get in there from school. Right. right. And then the connection at Disneyland, when I called them, they gave me phone numbers of a couple of people up at Walt at WDI and see, I had been oh, in wow. this maintenance design division at Disneyland. So it was easy into the facilities division there. And actually the, the mm. two men, my boss and his boss were also both industrial engineers. So they were very well acquainted oh, with wow. what I knew. Um, so I was able to yeah. get in. So I did not personally experience the competitiveness that you were talking about. And it, mm -hmm. it became mm -hmm. kind of a joke when it doubled and then 50% growth again, <laughs> they were like kind of sweeping the streets. And <laughs> so, you know, there, there aren't, what was happening was, and one of my dearest and closest friend was right in here is you had people working in the movie industry, which is what they can, they were telling stories right in the rise or off of movies. Mm -hmm. And so they were hiring people out of the movie industry. Well, none of these people mm -hmm. had ever experienced a regular paycheck let alone benefits in their yeah. entire lives. Oh, wow. And we were sort of sweeping them up yeah. in all these creative <laughs> positions. And people are like, I this have a great. paycheck every two weeks. Are you kidding me? Like, oh, I never heard gosh. such a thing. That's a miracle. You know, benefits. Like, I can go to the doctor. And so <laughs> it was this interesting culture of bringing people in and then trying to assimilate them into your company, yeah. like mm -hmm. how you work, how you make decisions, how do you get things done? everyone is yeah. every other person you meet is new right they don't need more than you know and and yet there's yeah. this deep tradition and culture of wdi that you know goes back to walt himself and his mm. you know the guys that helped him get started and so how do you assimilate mm -hmm. people into that so it was really interesting yeah. day so, so interesting. at that i don't know <laughs> <laughs> at least if you were in the movie industry, I don't think it was very competitive. Yeah. But and the and more on the engineering side, definitely architectural, where you know those people probably do get paychecks every two weeks usually. Um, that 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 is very competitive. And I think one of the other questions too was like, were there a lot of women in engineering? And I might remember one. I might remember one. <laughs> but that was were many, yeah. yeah. That's, oh yeah, yes, that, that was, was our next yeah, question. Went actually, to school, we were going to so. move on to that next, anyways. So yeah, there's there's been an increase of women in STEM fields um, in the recent years. But did you do you recall working with anyone, any other women at that time? Well, I mean, I I was the only woman in my class only a couple times. Mm. The vast majority of times, there there was one other woman. Oh wow! <laughs> so, not like a huge. Wow! Man. Yes, <laughs> that's crazy. That's great. Um, and there were a couple more of us in the industrial engineering field as well. Mm. So yeah, it's pretty light. Mm -hmm. What what um, got you into um, engineering uh, in in the eighties? Was yeah. was that something that you just you just were interested. <laughs> we're interested in, because I, I, I feel like, yeah, nowadays, like Emily said, you know, there's a lot more people getting into science, technology, engineering, and math, and it's all that stuff. Accessible. But back then, it, that's so cool to be, um, in a time that I don't think a lot of women were in engineering. And maybe I'm wrong, but like you said, you know, maybe there's one other person. What got you maybe. interested in in engineering at the time? Well, you know, my dad was a mechanical engineer. Oh wow. Um, and just, you know, like, that's what, that's not just his education. That's like what he was yeah. in his being, you know. Um, so I come by, and my mother is very good in math and numbers. So I, this is very strong in my sisters and I, a lot of math skills, which oh, wow. could nice. lend you towards engineering, but engineering little, and I was actually told this little girls were not supposed to be good in math and that oh, engineering wow. is not what women study. Wow. And so, um, proved I did college <laughs> math, but then I stopped the last year in high school. Cause like, I'm not going to do math. And I yeah. went to a local junior college here and I took classes in business law and psychology and oh, I don't gosh. know, some other things, you know, trying to find my way. 
Um, but I missed that in the first year I was there, I didn't take any math and I really missed it. So the second year I went back to take trigonometry and I, you know, and it was like easy, right? I loved it. And so I went to talk to one of the counselors and they started talking to me about engineering, which at first I was like, "Mm," you know, but they, you know, God bless that person who pushed me a little bit. And I still remember to this day going through the different engineering fields and I actually picked industrial engineering. It sounded interesting to me. And one of the roles or jobs of engineering, industrial engineers is, can be like plant layout and design, right? So it's, a, it's kind of this efficiency thing. Yeah. And I came home and I told my dad, I decided I was going to study industrial engineering and he didn't know what that was. So I told him a little bit about it and he says, and he pauses and there's silence and then he says, well, I guess you could design a dress factory <laughs> because women wear oh, dresses. Man. So oh, wow. I could. That's obviously <laughs> what you're like. I'm going to shake at. things up a little bit. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a problem yeah. because then I transferred down to Cal Poly Pomona uh-huh. and in the four year engineering curriculum, they have of the hundred and it's 168 credits. Is that right? For the four years, mm. there's two units of unrestricted electives. You can take underwater basket weaving, you know, whatever you want to. <laughs> and I had almost two years of classes that went in there. Oh, wow. So I was six years getting my, my bachelor's degree. I could have got it in five but then I took this six months off to do the co-op at Disneyland oh, yeah. and I, I worked part-time the last year I was in school. I wasn't. So since I was working to help put myself through school, I wasn't taking 16 units. I was only taking 12 units. And so the mm. whole thing ended up being another year. And I have to say the sixth year of getting my bachelor's degree, I was, I could never get it. Off on time. <laughs> I, <laughs> I was ready to be done. Oh, wow. <laughs> That is I so mean, cool. Though. That's so cool. Yeah, I have a master's degree, right? But anyhow. Wow. Yeah. But Wait, that did you was say you got your, your master's or you got your, really your bachelor's? Never oh, well, that was a, so that was my bachelor's, magna cum laude. Okay. Oh, so, wow. you know, with honors and, oh, and wow. I loved it. Um, that is so cool. And it has done me well in my career. Yeah. I didn't go back for my MBA until I was um, uh, 58 years old oh wow oh, wow and then so, how long did the mba take is I, that usually... I graduated with that when i was 60 <laughs> oh that's so oh, great that's so that's awesome. never too late wow how <laughs> so inspiring cool. never too late um Perfect. so you said that there was a lot of um a lot of animatronics that came into the building um what were some of the coolest things you got to see i imagine you got to see you know some animatronics or maybe some other you know cool things that they're working on what were some of the the most exciting things while you're working as an Imagineer or when you were working at Disneyland prior to that? Oh my gosh. Like two <laughs> hours. <laughs> so many things, I'm sure. <laughs> you know, a couple of things that jump out in my mind and you'll like this if you love the Indiana Jones ride. But oh, yes. um, so do you know in the ride when the vehicle comes around a corner and there's that big cobra oh, snake yeah. and he lashes out? At <laughs> oh, the yeah. Everybody knows that scene. <laughs> okay. Well, I met him in the Tahunga building. Oh, my gosh. Oh, so really? they had him built. They had him in his, in like, a, you know, a structure to hold him up. Yeah. Because he's a, you know, he's a big steel structure. Oh and my gosh. Uh, so the guys had him hooked up to the controls and they had a bunch of us come down to see what they think. And did we want to see him work? Because they wanted, they were trying to they try it out to make sure it worked. And yeah. um, so we were there and we we're like, oh, it's cool. You know, and then it started to move and it's jaw and it moved. And oh we're like, oh, yeah, gosh. that's pretty good. And then all of a sudden this thing goes, wham! <laughs> <laughs> I like, oh didn't God. see that coming. <laughs> They're like, get a little closer. I get a little closer. Okay. Oh. <laughs> I remember shrieking and jumping back. It was so real. So that was that was fun. You know, because they'd be working on stuff and they're like, hey, can you guys come down and take a look? We want to see what you think. Oh, my gosh. Um, one of the other things that was neat was building to the Indiana Jones ride because, you know, those are simulators on a Jeep chassis. That is So the they drive around on a yeah. Jeep chassis 
but they're on this thing that moves around and yeah. we had to contract out. We built each of those at WDI. They were trying to get an outside contractor to do them. And that was the biggest thing. You could never get outside companies to build what we wanted oh, wow. to the, our specification. So we ended up building those up in the Tahunga building and had engineers that wow. designed those. And, you know, outside contractors built parts and the hydraulics and stuff like that for, but we did all of the assembly. And it was funny. We used to joke about doing a production run. You know, you think about Chevy, you know, making 10 million of their F-150 trucks, right? We had a yeah. production run because we made 14, you know, it's like, oh, yeah. we're all here, 14. Oh, you know, yeah. you just build like one of this and one of that all the time. Wow. Oh, um, my gosh. Oh, my gosh. So that was fun. And then, you know, trying to program that thing. And that's another story to um, the um, the Star Tour simulators. They had those set up in the parking lot down at the 1401 building, which is in Glendale. Tahunga is, I don't know, like seven, eight miles north on the freeway above North, oh, wow. um, Glendale. Yeah. And uh, so I got to know the guy who was trying to program those things. So he was hours and hours, day after day, refining the motions of that thing to the movie, right? They film the movie. Yeah. And then he's yeah. trying to move this thing to the movie. And wow. until he finally got so motion sick, he couldn't stand it anymore. Cause he's in the <laughs> yeah. day, like, like, I'm oh, done. No, 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 Going like crazy, oh you know, gosh. diving and that lifting. So, so cool. It's interesting when you're inside, you don't really quite understand, but there's a huge range of motion. This this thing is wow. flying all around. Really? On its oh own, my gosh. Its cylinders, you know, to move it around. So that wow. is so those cool. are probably, yeah, some of my really good memories. And then just all the little scale models of things, um, you know, in the early stages of ride yeah. design. and the idea of storyboarding, you know, where it starts oh, yeah. on a flat board and they draw, um, yeah. and they'll put the pictures up on the storyboard, uh, literally oh, yeah. a board and, you know, in kind of left to right, you read, um, to tell the story. And that's where the story is refined first in 2d. Yeah. Until like, oh, that's kind of stupid, or I think you're getting distracted. <laughs> so it's just like making a movie. That's oh, the wow. same technique that they make films. They storyboard films. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we would, they would, we, they would storyboard the rides. Wow. You know, what do you want to have them see? What are the different scenes? What, how will the yeah. ride vehicle fit into that? Um, how fast you're going through things, you know, those water rides or whatever. What are you seeing? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. Until you come up with the story, then you start to build it in 3D. So seeing yeah. just in the, you know, for anything kind of that, that was really cool. The process. Yeah. And I think that's so interesting oh. hearing that it's the same process that a movie would go through because really the Disney rides, mm -hmm. I think that one thing that's keeps them standing apart from any other ride mm -hmm. is that it immerses you in such a way that it feels like you're a part of the movie. Yeah. You know, true. any other ride that you're in, they'll, They'll paint it a certain color and call it like a, you know, it's oh, it's a superhero ride. It's it's the color of the superhero or something. But Disney really envelops you in that story. And just the fact that they go through a storyboarding process and, and the sculptures and all that stuff just shows that attention to detail that yeah. is so amazing. Yep. They're so I'm good so at cool. that. Yeah. And that's a distinguishing feature. Thank you for saying that because I had got put that together in my mind. But that is a distinguishing feature of Disney is that the rides are a yeah. story. Mm -hmm. It's not just a roller coaster because even a Space Mountain, mm. you know, you're, you're launching, you fly through space and then there's the re-entry zone, you know, where yeah. they flash the lights and you slow down <laughs> yeah. and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, or you're trying to get away from something or whatever. So yeah. there's, it's always a story and, and rather than yeah. just a roller coaster that loops around and scares you half to death, there's <laughs> yeah, a story right. to it. And that's what, <laughs> that stuff, you yeah. know, that kind of nobody else takes the time to do that. And then the other yeah. thing is that the queue, if you've noticed for the most part, the queue line oh, is yeah. a story. 
you especially oh, yeah. want Indiana a Jones. part of the ride. Oh yeah, so especially good. Indiana Jones is probably the most yeah. elaborate. That is so fun. Story it's so cool. But yeah. Pirates has a bit of a oh. Q line story. Yeah. Um, yeah. Star um, Space Mountain Star Tours, has a yeah. Q line. You know, you oh, come Space inside Ma- yeah. and you hear them yeah. talking and the vehicles fly by and stuff. So, you know, when you're there, I know when I've been on, on a day when there's hardly anybody in the parks, you can just kind of fly right through and you're like, no, 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 no. You want to walk because you want to see everything in the Q so line. True. It's funny. Yeah. yeah. That's very that is purposeful. so true. Oh yeah. yeah, I love how they do that. You know, even if you're waiting, you're still in the experience. Yeah. So you're great. getting to enjoy it a little bit mm-hmm. before you enjoy the ride. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's true. All right. Well, yeah, we're kind of down to the end of the questions that we had prepared, but do you have any other stories or fun experiences that you'd like to share with us? You know, yeah, I, I do. I have a, a couple of things I want to say that I hope will make you <laughs> To, I, like I said, I want to take away the magic. I want to enhance the magic. But um, when I worked at Disneyland, um, I'll say kind of one of our nemesis was that Tom Sawyer Island. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't, you know, I don't know what Tom Sawyer Island is now, but it used to be this place where you kind of run all around and there were um, caves because like Tom Sawyer hid in the caves and stuff. Yeah, And there is like, they're kind of, they're not really wide enough for people to go back and forth. Right. So they're one way caves. And I remember hiding in the nooks and scaring my friends and having them <laughs> scary. It was just like this great fun kind of play. Yeah. But at the park, we were kind of all about crowd control oh. because of course in the summer it's very crowded and people are trying to get around and they are standing in line. And so the caves needed to be one way, right? There need to be an entrance and an exit. So you would put a little, not quite a turnstile thing, but right to, you know, like, no, this is the exit. <laughs> you know, you have to go around, you have to go this way. And, um, you know, when you got up to WDI, you realize that um, it's, a, it's a story. They're trying to entertain you, right? So Thomas Sawyer's Island is supposed to be this place. You can run in either end. Because then I got up there and people were like, oh, for God's sakes, they put these turnstiles in in the Thomas Sawyer's Island in the cave. <laughs> like, who are these people? <laughs> oh, that's, they're interfering. <laughs> that is so they're interfering. Yeah. That they're is... interfering with their efficiencies. Yeah, with yeah. efficiencies. That is so funny. That's oh, my funny. gosh. Well, the other side of it too, though, the tension is, I remember they redid the Alice, Alice in Wonderland ride when I was there and oh, we wow. did, redid Fantasyland yeah. and um, um, they had kind of almost, and this happened on Splash Mountain in Florida as well. They had like almost put the whole ride in and this was before you really had the project management who was empowered to keep this thing on track and on budget. And they, they would like tear out whole sections, like cutting steel beams because they wanted to move this over there. And, oh you know, wow. and so you had these huge cost overruns because the design process is never over, right? It's never done. Yeah. It's never good enough. It's never over. That creative mind just keeps going and going. Yeah. And some, one of the questions was about, you know, what creativity license do they give you? Well, I think in former times it was a lot, but they, the company yeah. suffered for that because of these huge delays and cost overruns. Yeah. And so hence you mm-hmm. ended up with this dual leadership trying to keep stuff on budget. But at some point you have to be empowered to say, we're done now. We're not tearing that out. You know, we have yeah. a budget in, a, in a time we have to get open. And so then you live yeah. in that kind of tension. You hope you build respect. So it's, you know, that's just kind of an interesting dynamic between the two organizations, um, you know, and how they, they lived in tension. But okay. And I, if there's time, I'm going to tell you one more yeah, Disneyland, uh, a, a Disneyland story. Yeah, let's hear it. So I've been up to on the top of the Matterhorn. Oh my gosh. Um, they talk about they talk about the fifth floor of the Matterhorn. There's an elevator inside the Matterhorn that takes you up to what they call the fifth floor, which is a platform. Oh my gosh. Actually, I guess they had a basketball hoop up there at one time because the maintenance guys would take the breaks. <laughs> yeah. And then from that platform <laughs> up to the top of the Matterhorn is a ladder. A, a run oh, ladder. you actually went up the... <gasps> And you pop down in the top top. because the top of the Matterhorn is where they launched Tinkerbell. 
And oh Tinkerbell launches from the top of the Matterhorn. She oh, flies the, over the, the castle. Fireworks. And then, you know, she lands somewhere. That's so crazy. the somewhere is a, a hut. It's like a fort type building and it's behind Big Thunder Mountain. Oh my and gosh. And they have a bunch of mattresses in there. And the wire <laughs> slings, if you look for it, from the top of the Matterhorn into this hut. Oh my and gosh. so one so of the guys crazy. that I worked with in industrial engineering had worked in fantasy land most of his career. And he had been on the crew that would launch Tinkerbell. So <laughs> she's a trapeze artist. Actually, I think she was oh. a retired trapeze artist. I guess that makes so sense. she's all yeah. Yeah. gowned up in her lights and stuff. Yeah. And she's in a harness. So she, she would click into the truck, you know, that slides on the, yeah. on the wire. She'd click in. And then they would, there's a pole in the middle of the Matterhorn at the top. There's a pole. And the guy that launches her puts a harness on and he's strapped to the pole so he doesn't fall off the mountain. Yeah. (laughs) He's strapped to the pole. And then you grab her by her ankles and you walk her out on the truck past the edge of the mountain. And then you, you shove her off. In the truck. Oh so you, this is why the guy's laughing into the mountain, right? You should shove her off. That's amazing. And oh right before God. you shove her, right before you shove her off, she's got a she's got to plug in, right? Just to plug herself in so her lights. Oh, really? Wow. So you got her by her ankles, right? And she's she's got her plug, and you're like, okay, she plugs herself in and you launch. Oh. And my then gosh. she flies across, and they have someone in the catch uh hut with the mattresses. Yeah, because if when she comes flying in, right, you got to grab her. They've got to <laughs> grab her by like an arm. She'll reach out and they spin her around so that she lands back first into oh. the mattresses. Right, you don't want her flying face first into these mattresses. Yeah. So someone has oh to catch gosh. her on the other end and spin her around. So she lands, oh but she gosh. has some speed control. She has like a little braking mechanism oh, could... in her hand, so she can. Mm. So she, you know, like doesn't get crazy. And he said there wow. was more than once where she would be too exuberant with the brakes and stopped out from the hut. Oh, and she's like dangling <laughs> out there. So she, she just gave her a little extra she's magic. Done, right? so she's done, right? So she's unplugged, right? Because she wanted her to disappear. So she's got to oh unplug her lights and she's so like dangling out there. So oh then they, they're gosh. like throwing a rope and trying to pull her in. And yeah. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's my Tinkerbell story. Did you, um, when you, when you were at the top of the mountain, was that just a crazy view of Disneyland? I mean, I'm sure no one, yeah. none of us fans have ever seen. No, so that must have been such that. a cool experience to see all of Disneyland like that. Well, you see all of Anaheim. <laughs> oh, my, oh yeah, true. And the interesting thing is they built Disneyland so that when you're in the park, you can't see outside of the park pretty much, you know, you can't see that, but from the top of the Matterhorn, that must have been just such a crazy experience. Just there's crazy the freeway, wheel. there's the, the, the Angel Stadium, there's everything. That's so cool. Oh, wow. Crazy story. That is such a fun story. Now, every time yeah. we see the fireworks show, I'm just going to think of a dangling Tinkerbell who didn't make <laughs> yeah. it all the way. To... <laughs> that is so great. Well, just know when she starts over the castle, right. somebody just launched yeah. her. What a fun ankles. job! Just throwing Tinkerbell, yeah. <laughs> helping her fly. Throwing Tinkerbell. So <laughs> well, thank so you. I, I think that's like the best place to end the episode because that is such a great story. But yeah. Sandra, thank you so much for coming yes, on. Thank you for joining this was us. Such a fun I time. Loved hearing your and story. I know everyone's going to be so excited to hear all these stories. Oh yeah! But thank you so much for coming on and. Yes. Um, sharing those amazing stories yeah i'm sure we'll go to disneyland sometime soon we'll make it happen yeah we'll do a group trip (laughs) i would love that i love the park i even though i know a lot of secrets i i yeah we'll we'll talk to hannah and sean and we'll all go together thank you this is really fun thank you so much all right bye